Okay, guys, right in the middle of my broadcast, I lost my feed. Um, so sorry about that. Gotta love technology. Um, I'm just going to go back and delete the previous broadcast. So, anyway, if you're with me, um, we're starting over again. But I'm just going to pick up where we left off. Uh, we're in Acts 28, um, talking about verse 15 is where we're at. We're, gonna, we're talking about the concluding section of Acts and uh, just picking up where I, we left off. Um, So we're in verse 15. I'll just read it again. Uh, it says, And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market of Appius and three ends to meet us. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now, hi, Dean. I'm glad you made it back. Sorry about that. Hopefully we won't lose each other again. So I'm just going to get straight to the point of this verse. The point that Luke wanted us to see is that when Paul saw these brethren, these Christians, he thanked God and took courage. Now what Luke is saying here has the idea that when Paul encountered these Christians, he was encouraged by the fact that Christians existed in these places. Why? Because it meant the gospel had spread beyond Rome into other parts of Italy. But what I was getting ready to say before I lost my broadcast is earlier um, is that at this point in Acts it's been three years since Paul had written his letter to the Christians in Rome the book we know as Romans now we should remember that in Romans 1 verse 13 Paul expressed in that verse that he desired to visit these brethren but up to this point he had been prevented from doing so and so for Paul to finally see these Christians that at least for at least three years that he's been hoping to see them, it would be encouraging to him. He's been waiting at least three years, and he's finally made it, and he gets to see these brethren. So putting all these things together, the point we should see from verses 14 and 15 is that Paul found Christians on his way to Rome. Now here Luke is showing us how Paul met several groups of Christians in various places. Now implied in this is that the gospel had to some degree spread across the nation of Italy by Christians who had traveled there prior to Paul's arrival. Now as far as we know, Paul would have been the first apostle to have set foot in Rome. So this brings us to verse 16, the second point, where Paul stayed by himself in Rome. It says in verse 16, when, he, when we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. Now, a very simple statement here. But I think as we enter into this verse, we need to remember that when Paul arrives in Rome, he's still a prisoner of Rome. Uh, he's still in the custody of of Rome in other words and so he's still being required to be guarded by this soldier now again we should remember that one reason for his trip to Rome is to appear before Caesar in order to be tried for the accusations the Jews were making against him but even though Paul is a prisoner he was not in a prison cell instead verse 30 of this chapter which we'll talk about in a little bit teaches us that where Paul stayed during his time in Rome was in his own rented quarters under the guardianship of the soldier. We might call it house arrest, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So, Luke is simply making the point, even though Paul was a prisoner, he was allowed to stay by himself. Paul wasn't treated like a typical prisoner. Rather, because of his character, Paul was allowed certain privileges that other prisoners would not be allowed to have, like to stay by himself rather than with other prisoners. So this brings us to verses 17 through 22, where we read, 
After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews, and when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you. For I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For concerning this sect, it is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. So Luke tells us, again, the point we're looking at is that Paul met with Jews in Rome. In the beginning of verses 17 through 20, uh, Luke tells us that three days after his arrival in Rome, Paul called together those who were leading men of the Jews. When they came together, um, he began saying to them these things that we read here. Now what Luke is recording for us here has the idea that Paul, he brought together these Jews in Rome that were considered to be leading men among them. Now the reason Paul does these things based on these verses is because he wanted to inform them of the circumstances that led Paul to coming to Rome. And so he says to them in verse 17, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Now at this point, Paul is informing these Jews that even though he had done nothing wrong to his fellow Jews, hadn't committed any crimes, or hadn't done anything against what the text calls their customs, they still handed him over as a prisoner to the Romans. Now notice in the text he addresses these Jews as brethren, not necessarily because they're brethren in Christ, but because they were fellow Jews. So going on into verse 18, Paul says that after he'd been handed over to the Romans, they examined Paul, they were willing to release him as a result of the fact that there was no ground to put Paul to death. Now here Paul is explaining that when he was tried by the Romans for the Jews' accusations against him, there was no reason for execution. They couldn't find any crime that Paul had committed. They couldn't find him guilty. So this is what led it, that has led to these series of events that eventually land Paul in Rome. He says in verse 19, he was forced to appeal to Caesar, but not because of accusations against the Jewish nation. Now here Paul is simply saying that because the Jews insisted on continuing to bring accusations against him, Paul was put in a position where he had to request to appear before Caesar, to still be tried for these accusations that have been already proven up to this point to be false. And so Paul's not bringing accusations against the Jews, he's just doing what he has to do because the Jews won't let go of their accusations against him. Now Paul probably adds this detail because he did not want his hearers, these leading men of the Jews, to think that he was going to fight back against the Jews who were accusing him. Now, Paul would not fight back because it would go against his character. Paul's character, was, in other words, Paul was someone who was willing to suffer through whatever he had to suffer through for the cause of Christ, even if that meant being falsely accused of things. Why? Because those things also happened to Jesus. Jesus was falsely accused of things, but still went through suffering. So in verse 20, Paul says that because of what he's explained, he requested to see the Jews in Rome and to speak with them as a result of the fact that he was wearing chains for the sake of the hope of Israel. Now at this point, Paul is explaining that the chain he is wearing as a Roman prisoner, it's not because of the accusations the Jews are bringing against him. It's not, or in other words, it's not because those accusations were true. But the chain was because of the fact that he was pre preaching a message concerning the hope of Israel. 
What that means is that Paul is wearing the chains worn by a Roman prisoner, not because he committed a crime, but because he preached the message concerning the hope the nation of Israel had as a result of the promises God had made to his people, beginning with Abraham and the coming Messiah that the Jews were expecting. And so what Paul says here is another way of saying that him being a prisoner of Rome is a direct result of him preaching the gospel message of Jesus, of Jesus being the Messiah and the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises that God made to his people. And so going on into verses 21 and 22, Luke records for us the Roman Jews' response to these things that Paul has just said concerning um, what he said. So Luke begins here by recording for us in verse 21 that the Jews began their response by saying, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything about you. In this statement, the Jews are explaining to Paul that they weren't aware of these things. They hadn't received any information about what has led to Paul's coming to Rome, about these accusations. And also implied here is that the Jews in Jerusalem, they could have communicated these things to other Jews around the world, either by letter or by traveling to Rome to communicate these things in person, but that did not happen. So these Jews that Paul is talking to here, they're not aware that any of this has happened. They're not aware of what's going on with Paul before he says these things. And so since that's true, they say to Paul in verse 22, But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For concerning this sect... It is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. Now what the Jews say to Paul here has the idea that they desire to hear more from Paul about Christians, about Christianity. Because even though they were not aware of the specific accusations against Paul, they were aware that Christianity, here referred to as a sect, was spoken against everywhere. Now something else we should understand, the fact that these Jews refer to Christianity as a sect, this further indicates that these Jews were not Christians. And so what they request here would be an opportunity for Paul to preach the gospel to them. And so putting verses 17 through 22 together, the point being made here is that Paul met with Jews in Rome. As we can see from the text, one of Paul's desires when he arrived in Rome was to meet with the Jews in order to quote-unquote clear the air about what the Jerusalem Jews were accusing him of. He wanted to clear up things. But what we find, however, is that these Roman Jews, they were not aware of these things, and as a result, they wanted to hear more about this message that Paul preached about. They wanted to know, who are these Christians? Who, and that's, again, that's why they viewed them as a sect. In some people's mind, Christianity was just a sect of Judaism. And so Paul has this opportunity to preach the gospel to them and inform them what Christianity is really about, who Christians really are, opening the door to preach the gospel. And this brings us to verses 23 through 31. Uh, it's a 30, but there's 31 verses in Acts 28. And the point we're going to be looking at here is that Paul preached openly in Rome. I'll read these verses. When they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. When they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your father, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. 
You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they, there's, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. When he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters, and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness, unhindered. So Paul preached openly in Rome. This point begins with Luke telling us in verse 23, that when the Jews had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and Paul began to explain to them what they had requested. And Luke says he did this by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning until evening. Now what, the Jews, or what Luke records here has the idea that the Jews, they made what we might call an appointment with Paul to meet with him, and as a result, large numbers of Jews came to Paul where he was staying because they wanted to hear Paul's explanation of the kingdom of God. And in that time, Paul was also attempting to convince them that Jesus was their long-expected Messiah, and does so using the writings of Moses and the prophets all day morning until evening. Now, but it says he was solemnly testifying. In other words, Paul was preaching in a very confident manner, knowing that what he was preaching is true. But then in verse 24, Luke tells us that in response to Paul's preaching, some were being persuaded, others would not believe. Now, here Luke is simply indicating the results of Paul's preaching. Some believed, some were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, would obey the gospel, but others were not. Now this would ultimately is a result of the condition of people's hearts. Some were open to the truth of the gospel, others were not. So, going on into verse 25, Luke reports for us that when these Jews and Paul did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul, they began leaving um, after Paul spoke one parting word. He begins here by saying, The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers. This is an introductory statement to what he'll begin to say in verse 26. But this statement here has the idea that when these unbelieving Jews left Paul, Paul left them with a message that came through Isaiah. A message that Paul says the Holy Spirit, God, spoke through Isaiah to their Jewish ancestors. Now what that means is that on these unbelie as these unbelieving Jews were leaving the place where Paul was staying, he told them, you know what? Isaiah said something about you. God, through Isaiah, said something about you and to your ancestors. And so in verses 26 and 27, Paul quotes from Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. And he quotes this passage in order to show that the reason these unbelieving Jews refused to believe in the gospel message, again, is because of the condition of their hearts. So quoting from Isaiah 6, verse 9, in verse 26, Paul begins by saying to these Jews, Go to this people and say, you will keep hearing, but you will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. Now what this passage in Isaiah says has the idea that people, they're, they'll hear the truth. And they'll see what the truth says. But they won't understand it. They won't perceive it. In other words, they might hear with their ears, see with their eyes. But it doesn't go past that. They won't take it into their hearts. They won't really understand what God is communicating to them. Why? It's because of the heart. They've blinded themselves. They've deafened themselves to God's 
message. And Paul says to the unbelieving Jews, this passage is talking about you. You don't have a heart that's open to the truth. So continuing his quotation of Isaiah 6 and verse 27, he quotes from Isaiah 6 verse 10 and says, For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Now it is in this passage, it is right here in verse 27, that we see that unbelief, is because of the condition of the heart. Belief, on the other side of the coin, is also because of the condition of the heart. Now the reason we know this is because the images that are used here in verse 27 refer to the fact that the heart is no longer able to receive the truth, or on the opposite end, is able to receive to receive the truth. And so there's a contrast being drawn here. The last part of this verse draws a contrast and has the idea that if the heart is receptive to the truth, people would be spiritually healed as a result of their obedience to the truth of God's word. Now Paul is probably applying these things here to not only emphasize the Jews' unbelief, but also to emphasize the necessity to believe in the gospel. And so reaching a conclusion from verses 26 and 27, Paul says in verse 28 that since many of these Jews have refused to believe, the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, because they will also listen. Now what Paul says here in verse 28 has the idea that since the Jews refuse to believe and refuse to accept God's message of salvation, that same message would go to the Gentiles, non-Jews, because they they would be receptive to the truth of God's word. Now this is evidenced in the fact that many of the Gentiles that Paul had preached to received the gospel, And furthermore, this is evidenced by the fact that people in Rome, many of which who were Gentiles, received and obeyed the gospel. And so going on into verse 29, Luke records for us that when Paul had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. Now I think the first thing we should understand about verse 29 is that there is some debate as to whether or not this was actually that ver- as to whether or not verse 29 was actually in Luke's original writing but even though that's the case this does not change the meaning or the point of the text of verses 26 through 28 the point of verses 26 through 28 is that some Jews did not believe in the gospel message in the same way they didn't believe in the message of Isaiah in his day It's for this reason that the text says these Jews, after hearing the words of Isaiah, left having this great dispute among themselves, arguing about this text and about Paul's preaching. And so, in verses 30 and 31, Luke concludes the chapter by telling us that for two full years, Paul was able to stay in his own rented quarters, and that he welcomed all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness and unhindered. In these concluding verses of Acts 28, in these concluding verses of the book of Acts, Luke is explaining once again that Paul was able to stay by himself in a place that he himself rented, but also, unlike many other places, was able to preach and teach about God's kingdom and about Jesus freely and with nobody preventing him from doing so. This was as freely as Paul was able to preach at this point in Acts. And so there's a degree of irony here. Paul's a prisoner, but as a prisoner, he was most able to preach freely. This was the most freedom he had to preach. 
during these two years that he was under house arrest in his own rented quarters in the city of Rome. So this tells us that at this time, Paul's quote-unquote imprisonment consisted of being under house arrest, but this did not prevent him from preaching and teaching. He had complete freedom in that respect. And so when we put verses 23 through 31 together, the point being made in these verses is that Paul was able to preach freely in Rome. Now here Luke is showing us that Rome was unlike any other place where Paul preached. The reason for this is because in Rome, at this point in time, this two-year period, Paul did not face any persecution. Nobody was fighting against him. He wasn't facing any pushback. He was able to teach and preach freely. Now that doesn't mean people didn't always believe what he had to say, because we see from these Jews that they didn't always believe. But Paul wasn't being stopped. There was nobody trying to stop him from preaching. And again, irony. Because it's only as a prisoner that Paul was free to preach and teach without hindrance. And so what do we say? What is the point that Luke wants us to see in verses 11 through 31 of Acts 28? I, I think the point is that Paul's time in Rome was overall positive. It was positive because he met Christians there. It was positive because he was able to stay by himself there. It was positive because he met Jews there who wanted to hear the gospel even if some did not believe, and it was positive because he was able to preach and teach freely. But we also have to ask, why does Luke close the book in this way? Why doesn't he tell us more? Well, maybe there's not a clear answer to that. But one possible reason is that Luke closes his book in this way because he wanted to show his original reader a man named Theophilus how the gospel spread all throughout the Roman Empire that's really how we see Acts breaking down the beginning of Acts shows how the gospel spread in Jerusalem the middle of Acts shows how it spread through the rest of Israel and the last part of Acts shows how it spread throughout the rest of the known world that was the Roman Empire, including Rome itself. So the book of Acts, it's a story of how the gospel spread from one city, Jerusalem, all throughout the known world, the known first century world at that time. So what do we learn from this? The lesson we learned from these things is that we must make every effort to spread the gospel everywhere we go. In our hometown, in our county, in our state, the country, the world. But how do we do that? How do we spread the gospel? We do this by being an example. We can do this by keeping our eyes open for those opportunities to share the gospel. And we can do this with each other's encouragement. There's a lot of great lessons to be learned from Acts. Even working through these 28 chapters, it's still only scratching the surface. Acts is a valuable tool for us to know how to be a faithful follower of Christ, how to live out our lives as Christians in our everyday life. Since that's true, we always have to come back to Acts so that we can gain a greater idea of who we are 
and why we do what we do as New Testament Christians. And Acts helps us to gain a greater idea of how to show people the truth. It gives us an idea of what it means to be a follower of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And those are just a few things that we can learn from what we studied today. And a few things that we can learn from the overall book of Acts. Again, as I said before, my previous broadcast got knocked off. This is kind of bittersweet for me. I've enjoyed X. And especially for my brethren at the Carbon Emory Church, I hope you have as well. Again, it pains me that I couldn't be in the same place to end our study of this book together. miss you guys. We hope we can get back to our Sunday morning Bible classes and Sunday afternoon very soon. Taking next Sunday off, but we'll be back the following Sunday with something new. But as we close Acts, as I always do, just keep on keeping on. Come back to Acts. Don't let the end of our study of this book together be the last time you study this book. Keep coming back to it. There's so much that can be learned from this book. So don't stop studying it just because our study together has ended. Again, as I said before, if there's any other comments or questions about Acts, about anything we've studied, please let me know. I'd love to talk to you more. About it. This broadcast is going to stay on. It's going to get shared to the Carbon Emory Church of Christ Facebook page and the YouTube channel by the same name. Before I let you guys go, let's close with a prayer. Father in heaven, we come before your throne. We thank you for Acts. The Acts of the Apostles as its official name. Father, we thank you for the insight that it provides us into your will and to faithful service of our early brothers and sisters in Christ and like Paul and Peter and Philip and so many others, God, that and Barnabas and others that faithfully carried out your work even in the face of difficulties and persecution help us to take encouragement from this book and to never stop studying it God and to look to its contents so that we might strive to follow in the example of these great men and great women that we also find described in this book that were servants of you who helped to further the cause of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for those who are present here tonight. Thank you for those who are interested in studying your word. Pray that you might help us to find those opportunities, God, that those hearts that are receptive to your truth. Father, we know but as our Lord told Paul, you have people in our cities, God, but you've left it in our hands to go and find them. Help us to just keep our minds, our hearts, and our eyes open so that we can find the, your people that are ready to receive the gospel. Father, we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for his example, God. The faithful service clear up to the cross. We thank you for his death, his burial, and his resurrection that gives us the hope and the forgiveness of sins. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Alright guys. A little emotional. But I love you guys. I look forward to our next study. Keep up the great work, keep up the God work, as I like to say sometimes.
Love you, Dina. And I love all you guys, uh, you silent participants who don't comment, but I know you're there. Thanks for being with me. And um, I'll see you guys in a couple weeks, or I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Wednesday will, uh, no, Wednesday will be on YouTube because we're back at our church building. Um, so catch us on YouTube on Wednesday night. Um, but as far as our Facebook Live Bible studies, uh, I'm taking next Sunday off, uh, so we'll be back in a couple weeks. So, love you guys. God bless. And, you know, you keep on keeping on, and all you guys keep on keeping on. Be safe and stay healthy. Catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.